never put cast iron or carbon steel in there on pain of death. Um, but yeah, like Not just. Pain of death. <laughs> Lisa will find you. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to today's edition of Ask the Test Kitchen. This is the Tasting and Testing Edition. I'm Lisa McManus. I'm Lauren Savoy. And I'm Kate Shannon. And we're all on the Tasting and Testing team, which means we test kitchen equipment and do taste tests of supermarket ingredients. So I have all the questions here on my phone that we've asked people to submit. Um, the first one is from Jerry, and he said, regarding the kitchen tools, pots, pans, and utensils that ATK uses, do you ever wash and reuse your gear? In every TV episode, it appears that all your equipment has come straight from the factory, no scratches or stains. We don't throw them all in the trash. Right. <laughs> uh, we have actually multiple sets of equipment. So we have just a photo quality set so that when anytime we're doing videos or TV or anything like that, you see fresh, beautiful looking equipment. Um, and then over time, those get wear and tear and they go into sort of the general population where the cooks are cooking with them every single day and they get beat up a lot more. But no, we don't, yeah. <laughs> we don't constantly rebuy equipment. Yeah, and also, you know, even when we do tastings and testings, um, when we're going to test equipment, we buy two copies of everything at least. Um, one copy is, we call it the testing copy, that's the one we put through all the abuse of the testing. Um, and the other one is the photocopy, and that's used for when we take a nice picture of it or use it in video. Um, often by the end of testing, we'll pull that one out and look at that versus the tested copy because it, you will see exactly how far degraded it may have become in the course of testing. Um, and that gives us some information about durability. But also, we will basically have a backup in case the testing copy fails for some reason, and we're not just dinging it on one copy of some piece of equipment. So we always have a testing and a photocopy, and then the kitchen as a whole has as well. Um, we also, we don't always just do that to make you feel bad about your kitchen equipment not looking perfect all the time. If a bowl is scratched and you can't see through it really clearly, or, you know, th that's part of just like, giving you the visibility into the um, process of cooking rather than, you know, seeing the scratched bowl. Um, but if stuff gets really beat up, we retest. We will go back. This is one reason we stock everything in the kitchen. That makes us go back and retest if it really doesn't hold up to daily use in the kitchen. So it's an ongoing testing for us, and it's all part of what we do. Okay, we have another question from Buzz Beauchamp. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's a real name, but it's pretty cool. Okay, where can I find the small glass bowls ATK always uses to measure out ingredients? And Kate knows the answer to that, so I'm gonna let her take it. So those are a six-piece nesting set from Anchor Hawking. We reviewed them a couple of years ago, and we love that set in particular because there are lots of different sizes. If you're measing an ingredient or ingredients for a stir fry, something like that, we love to have little bowls, big bowls, every size bowl that you need. Susan wants to know, what's the best way to clean and disinfect a wooden rolling pin? I've been bad and I haven't cleaned mine since I made cookies for Christmas. It's still sitting on my counter. I know I'm terrible. <laughs> Susan, don't feel bad about yourself. We've all been there. She's been waiting months for this answer. Yeah, you know, the best way to clean anything is just hot, soapy water. It kills most bacteria. Yeah, I mean, I think you can clean your wood utensils the same exact way that you clean anything else. Um, we do like to sometimes rub down with oil after it's clean to protect the wooden surface. Otherwise, it has a tendency to dry out mm -hmm. um, and crack. But other than that, you can just treat it as you would any other piece of equipment. Yeah, we've done that test on cutting boards as well. We actually sent them to the lab, right? Mm -hmm. we, we've sent plastic and wood cutting boards, and they put bacteria on them, and they, they you know see how much the bacteria grows in a certain amount of time and wash them with hot, soapy water. And honestly, like nothing works better than just a good scrub with hot soapy water. Mm -hmm. You can buy all kinds of chemicals and stuff. It doesn't really matter. Just hot soapy water will clean yep. it. And, and then, you know, food grade mineral oil, mm -hmm. rub it down. And it'll be good as new. What if I put it in the dishwasher? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you? Are you Susan? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Susan. <laughs> you can Susan. put it in the dishwasher. Oh. No, actually, I'm doing a story right now where I'm testing wooden spoons, and it seems like people fall into two camps, people who always put their wooden spoons in the dishwasher and people who never would do that in a million years. I just dishwash them 10 times in a row, and... They're pretty sad looking. They're kind of sad, yeah. They're real dry. dry. They like came in like gleaming and beautiful, like this wood surface here, 
and now they're like bone dry and they look they look ancient. They look like old driftwood. <laughs> <laughs> and like I think if you did it once by mistake, probably fine. But it's not a great way to treat wood. Wood is a really organic thing. It wants, it's like your skin, you know? If you ran your hand through the dishwasher oh, 10 geez. times, your skin would be a mess, right? Yeah. You don't want to do that. Hot soap and water, a little bit of moisturizer, you're fine, you know? Let's think of the wood the same way. Oh, here's a good one from Gideon Lopez. Can foil and parchment paper be substituted for each other when making a sling, or does it affect the taste, texture, or appearance? And what he's talking about is when we do something like brownies, we often will put a foil sling in the pan, and then when you're going to take it out, you can lift the whole thing out, and that makes really nice crisp edges, and you're not digging things out of a pan, so you don't lose any to the first mm -hmm. cuts. So what do you guys think, foil and parchment? I use them interchangeably. I don't know if that's the uh, test kitchen approved method. <laughs> I, I use whatever I have on hand, and it's worked fine for me so far. Yeah. I actually, I actually took the liberty of asking Keith Dresser, who's our head of recipe development at Cook's Illustrated, because I thought, yeah, I think it would be okay, but I thought, let me find out from the top. And he said it's fine. The only thing oh, that might happen, yeah, <laughs> Keith has given you his blessing. Um, <laughs> but the only thing is that it's sometimes the foil is easier to kind of push into the pan to make it mm. stay down so it doesn't like ride up, but I'm sure that once the batter goes in, it flattens out, but you've got to be a little more careful putting the parchment in so that it doesn't yeah. kind of ride up and give you like a weird bump or something. And has anyone like ever said no to a slightly like not flattened brownie? Yeah, plus you yeah. can like say that's, you know, that's the one the cook gets to eat because, mm -hmm. or like, you know, if you're trimming the edges to make perfect squares for presentation, you know, all those edges are for me, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, so a question here is, what are good substitutes for single-use plastic wrap? How can we be more environmentally friendly in the kitchen? I am uh, late on the bandwagon of environmentally friendly changes, so I'm going to pass that one. <laughs> Here's one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you know, we do, we've reviewed things like reusable uh, storage bags, and so we have a favorite of that. So if you're bringing your sandwich or whatever to work or school mm -hmm. every day, you can use a reusable plastic bag, and we've reused that. Um, for things like covering bowls, we have some silicone bone, bowl covers that we like um, that will seal nicely to the top of the bowl, and you don't have to use a piece of plastic wrap. For If you're taking it to a potluck, it looks kind of pretty. It's... The one we like is shaped like a lily pad. It's kind of cute. And, um, and you can also use it in the microwave or just to store stuff in the fridge, you know, if you have some leftover fruit salad or whatever, or soup. We, have, we like bees wrap, yeah. right? The piggy steamer. The piggy steamer can be used as a bowl cover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a little silicone lid. Instead of using a um, paper towel or cling wrap in the microwave, you can use this little silicone lid. It has some venting holes where the little pig snout is and little ears that stick up that you can grab and stay cool. Yeah, recently I've started using storage containers a lot more. Mm -hmm. I used to use baggies a lot for, you know, half a lemon or half an onion, things like that. But Lisa reviewed glass storage containers and plastic storage containers, and they come in a million sizes. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like I have all the right sizes, so it's much easier mm -hmm. to pull them out and actually use them for the kind of odds and ends. Yeah, and they go in the freezer, in the fridge, in the mm -hmm. microwave if you're going to do that. and. Um, you know, you can just use them over and over again instead of getting a new piece of plastic wrap every time. Okay, so this is probably one of our most frequently asked questions, which is, why don't you include Trader Joe's and Costco brand products in your taste tests? <laughs> We've all answered this so much. <laughs> yes, so with our taste tests, we really try to focus on products that are nationally available. So we spend a ton of time contacting companies, figuring out where their products are sold, how easy they are to find. Um, and the problem with Trader Joe's and Costco, although they're super popular and we know a lot of you love them, is that a lot of our readers just can't find them. They don't have a Trader Joe's close to them, they don't have a Costco, and also we don't know who makes them, so it's possible that today Trader Joe's, I don't know, orange juice is made by a certain company and it's great and we review it, but then we don't know if it changes in a week or a month or a year to a different company. Mm -hmm. yeah. They could source it from a different supplier and it will change completely and it's not valid anymore. Yeah. Also, I mean, people will make pilgrimages to drive to Trader Joe's if there's one like 75 miles from their house and they stock up. But we really want people to be able to cook every day and not like plan for stuff and hoard stuff and say, oh, this is for special. 
So if you really, you know, are only looking at ingredients that are hard to find for some people, it's not really uh, useful. And that applies to all store brands, not just mm -hmm. Trader Joe's and Costco. We don't review any store brands for the same reasons. We are starting to do something where we're reviewing Amazon Basics equipment, but it's being reviewed separately in a story that's on our website um, where you can go and you can look for what we've said about Amazon Basics equipment. A lot of it's really similar to the equipment that we've tested, strangely enough. and. Um, you know, we're looking at it to see if it's really a good deal or if it's not as good. And we have discussed doing that for certain products like Trader Joe's or something, and that may be coming along, but at this point, we're really not including them, and we wouldn't include them in the regular taste test. What is the best way to care for and what to avoid in my new nonstick pans? Oh, good question. So if you take good care of your nonstick skillet, it will last a long time, um, but if you don't, it will deteriorate really quickly. Um, so a couple things to do would be to avoid metal utensils and definitely avoid using a knife in your skillet. If you're making a frittata or something, do not cut it in the pan. Slide your egg out first. Um, that's the number one tip. And then another thing you can do, people don't know this, but you can season a nonstick skillet. Mm. So the same way you would season a cast iron skillet by rubbing a little oil into it over, um, what, medium heat, I think. You can do that with a nonstick skillet, and that helps it retain its really slick surface. I had a question, yeah. though. A lot of nonstick pans now say it's OK to use metal utensils, but you did not find that to be the case, no. right? No. I really think with this, it's better safe than sorry. Just get out a wooden spoon, use your silicone spatula. Just don't tempt fate. It's really tempting to stack them in your cabinet or wherever you store them, but the bottom of one can scratch the surface of another. So either don't stack them, which isn't super realistic, <laughs> or um, what I like to do is put a paper towel or a paper plate, um, anything kind of soft that can protect them from each other. Yeah, because you can go all that trouble of not using the metal utensil and then stick a metal pan in it. Same difference. Yeah. So. Is it bad if I dishwash my nonstick pans, nonstick <laughs> <laughs> so many dishwasher so nonstick questions. Yeah. Yes. Like yes, yes no it is bad. <laughs> yes. Come on, can I dishwash it? No. I feel like I would constantly be like, yes. I don't know. I think it's okay. You know, but dishwashers are awesome. A lot. You know, they're saving us a lot of labor. But at the same time, it's like knives should not go in there. But don't put your cookware in there. Really. I mean, especially nonstick. Anything you're doing to nonstick is starting to wear it off. So if you want to keep it alive longer, the dishwasher is a harsh environment. It's you know hot and soapy for a long time. The soap tends to be kind of acidic. Um, things jostle against each other. So all those things are not good for knives, for nonstick. Never put cast iron or carbon steel in there on pain of death. Um, but yeah, like not just pain of death. <laughs> Lisa will find you. <laughs> yeah, no, um, everyone in my family knows that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like the dishwashers, do your silverware and your glasses and your plates and stuff in there and like leave the sort of more delicate things to, you know, hand wash washing. Hand. And we have tested dish soap and sponges, so we can tell you all about those. Yeah. See, I guess my current apartment doesn't have a dishwasher, so like fantasizing about dishwashers, I'm like, <laughs> yes. I would put all of that in the dishwasher. <laughs> Wedge it in there. How to tell, oh wait, it's from Fran. Okay. How to tell when meats are done if you don't have a thermometer or a good one. You should buy a thermometer. You should, you should, thermometer. You should just do it. Yeah, yeah, we're all like, buy a thermometer. So we've reviewed a ton of different thermometers, and the one that we use the most is called the Thermapen. It's great, it's incredibly accurate, it's fast, it's comfortable and easy to use. Um, but if you're not quite ready to spend $100 on the Thermapen, which is fair, mm -hmm. you can also consider the Thermapop, which I think is about 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, it's made from the same company, Thermaworks, and it's also super accurate and fast and really convenient. And with that one, you're kind of just guessing or you're like poking into your food. And if you do that too many times, you kind of start to mangle your food. Um, so if you want the best results, it's always best to get a thermometer. and. We've agreed that the trick with your your wrist, yeah, that's kind of your, like your poking hand, your hand. Um, that that doesn't work. Yeah, no. <laughs> and really, like thirty dollars for a thermometer that actually tells you the temperature you're trying to go for 
it's so much worth it when you consider all the food you're buying and eating kind of subpar to what it could be, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it's not just meat. So mm -hmm. if you don't cook a lot of burgers or steaks, it's not a bad use of money because we temp everything. I mean, in yeah. the test kitchen, we take the temperature of baked potatoes, of bread, right. of caramel, yeah. of kind of everything we cook, we yeah. take the temperature of. That's yeah. so, even an expert can mess it up without a thermometer. Yeah. I mean, you know, you just, why guess? And $30 is a drop in the bucket compared to everything you're baking or roasting or grilling that you're paying for and you're not getting it the way you want it. Well, that question is all you, Lisa. Jason Romo has asked the right person, what is the best way to resurrect a cast iron pan that has been neglected? Someone forgot to clean it after steering steaks on New Year's Eve. Well, wow, New Year's Eve. Okay. That someone is getting up <laughs> blasted right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yo, know, here's the thing about cast iron. Don't be afraid. You cannot ruin this pan no, ma no matter what. You, you could leave it outside and it will be fine. Like, it will rust. Uh, it'll be gunky. But you can just go in there with steel wool, scrape it all out, scrub it down, rinse it off, and start over no matter what. So there's really no way to destroy a cast iron pan. So you just want to go in there with steel wool, scrub off all the old food and gunk and any rust, rinse it off, dry it really well on the stove top um, so you get any little pockets of moisture out. Rub it with oil very lightly, you know, buff, put it in, buff it right out and outside, inside of the pan, the rim, the handle, and then heat it up and it will smoke a little, but then you let it cool down and you can repeat that if you need to and it'll be fine. Yeah, and I feel your pain. Um, <laughs> my husband loves to cook in cast iron, uh, does not like to maintain his cast iron pan, so it falls on me to be a cast iron doctor regularly. <laughs> so anything you can think someone has done to mess up a cast iron, my husband has absolutely done it, and I've managed to resurrect them from the grave multiple times. So this is why they're not really handy. You're just hiding them to save well, yourself yes, the work. Yes, exactly, because I know that he'll cook in them. And his favorite thing to make in them is like a tomato pasta, which is like an acidic sauce yep. that like sticks to the pan with yep. like cheese and, and pasta. And then he doesn't want to clean it. So he leaves it filled with water and then it rusts. And then it's my job <laughs> to spend like 20 minutes to re-oil it. Oh boy. Yeah, well, you know, you're living proof that this, these pans cannot really be destroyed. So, yeah, you're fine. Just, you'll have to start over with the seasoning, but it'll come back very shortly if you use the pan. Enamel Dutch oven. Firm whisk that isn't metal and will scratch. Silicone are too flimsy. Ideas? I think what he's saying is <laughs> what sort of tools should you use in your enamel Dutch oven that won't scratch it? Well, we've actually tested nonstick whisks, and our winner is made of metal, and it's by Queasy Pro, and it has a very thin, clear silicone coating on it, so it won't scratch up your, mm. your cookware, but it acts like a metal whisk. I mean, it's really effective, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, sturdy and strong. Mm -hmm. And delicate enough to get in there, but not, you know, some of them are real clunky. So we have tested them. That's what yeah. we recommend if you want a whisk in some kind of cookware that you don't want to damage. Oh, this is a good one. So what are your top three tips for storing and organizing cooking equipment and tools? I have one. If you have a cast iron pan and it's really heavy, don't put it at the bottom of a drawer or under a bunch of other pans. Um, put it somewhere, either keep it on your stovetop or, or level with your stovetop so that you'll be wanting to use it. If you have to dig it out mm -hmm. and haul it up, it will just stay unused, which is sad. Yeah, I definitely don't do that, and I definitely don't really use my cast iron pan. Yeah, it changed completely when I moved it to the same level as my stovetop. I have a small kitchen, but I have two crocks for utensils. One is for anything that's wooden or nonstick safe, um, so any spatulas I, or whisks or anything that I can use in nonstick, and one that's for metal utensils. Um, and this is so that anytime someone is at my house cooking in it, it's very easy for them to reach for the appropriate tool <laughs> so as not to damage my cookware. I have to think about mine. You're so organized. Though. Yeah, you're I'm a very sure organized your entire person. kitchen is like super perfectly organized. Okay, so this is a little bit of a stretch, 
But one of my main tips for staying organized with my tools is that I have two sets of measuring cups and two sets of measuring spoons mm -hmm. because I use them all the time and I found that I was constantly missing the size that I needed because it was dirty. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the best tip is getting two of the things you use a lot. I do that with tongs. I think I have like a million so pairs of tongs. tongs. Yeah. Got at least three, three pairs of tongs. Yep, the, like the <laughs> nine inch, the 12 inch, and the 16 inch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And even though 16 inches is kind of a grilling tongue, I keep it in the house for getting cereal off the top shelf because I am a <laughs> shrimp and, you know, it just, I can reach everything. Steph Millo wants to know, can one achieve the Maillard reaction using nonstick cookware? Oh, that is a good question. So the Maillard reaction is basically when food develops really flavorful browning, mm -hmm. like a pan sauce, you know, when all those cooked on bits from your steak, like that's the Maillard reaction, basically. Mm -hmm. And you could do it in a nonstick skillet. We've done some tests, um, but you're really better off using a stainless steel pan or a carbon steel pan, or even I think cast iron, something mm -hmm. that you can really crank the heat up on, get it really hot, um, and then you don't have to worry about, one, if you're gonna damage your nonstick surface at all, um, and you just know that it's going to be much more reliable and quicker and better overall. Yeah, I mean, the Maillard reaction is the proteins and the sugars mm -hmm. and high heat. Yeah. So you don't really want to crank the heat on your nonstick pan, mm -hmm. as Kate was saying. Although the plus side is if you're going to stir fry in there, the little brown bits stick to the food in a nonstick pan as opposed to the pan. But it's I don't know, not always worth it to have yeah. your high heat with nonstick. And Kate? It's now done, what, two testings of nonstick pans? Uh-huh, I've done a lot of testing of them. And Let's how many eggs that. do you think you've fried over the course of two testings? A thousand. Oh, yeah. A thousand? <laughs> yeah. Not an exaggeration. No. We do a test to evaluate the nonstick surface by cooking an egg with no oil, no fat, just in a dry skillet, um, up to 50 times or until it sticks. And I've done that with I think 20 different pans, so. And you do it twice for each testing. She does yes. it at the beginning, and then she does all her cooking tests, and then she does it at the end. So yeah, just yeah. do the math, it's crazy. It's a lot of eggs. <laughs> yes. Ooh, I like this one. Ohio Homegirl wants to know, what's your favorite thing to cook at home for yourself? Well, I'd say as a team, kind of across the board, we really like to cook potatoes. Yes. Um, <laughs> potatoes come up a lot. I'll say I love patatas bravas. We have a recipe from a few years ago that's so good. It's as good as any tapas restaurant I've ever been to. So I'll start with that one. I have to say potatoes are pretty great. I, I like our baked potato recipe, which yeah. is bizarre, but it makes better baked potatoes. They come out fluffier and just kind of that nice way that you really want them, that you kind of get like it's kind of a crapshoot most of the time. I think hands down my favorite ATK recipe to cook ever, I'm just gonna have to say it's pasti ceci, uh, which is ditalini pasta with chickpeas. It is fantastic. It's like one of those recipes where it's just so much better than the sum of its parts, and you can't explain why, but I've made it, I've made it so many times, and any time I've made it for friends, they've always asked for the recipe, so it's my go-to. So that's all the time we have for today for Ask the Tasting and Testing Team. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit like, uh, subscribe to the series, and ask any other questions you have in the comments below.